All right, let's check in with Alex Morano, who's going to fight Anthony Pettis next weekend in Las Vegas. UFC Vegas 17, I believe we're calling this event. These names are all over the place, but uh, final <laughs> event of the year. Pretty cool way to cap off the year. Alex, good to see you, man. How are you? Cool, man. I'm doing awesome. Uh, you know, kind of in like a, a fireball two-week fight camp. It's been a lot of fun. You know, anytime coming to fight camp in good shape always makes things easy. And it was funny, you know, after my fight, uh, you know, mid-November, I was kind of perusing all the different fight cards and I had a few teammates on this, on this card. And I was like, man, it would be crazy to get on that card. But I was like, but there's no way, you know, I just fought and dude, sure enough, man, they offer, they offer me Pettis on the last, the last card of the year, arguably one of the best fight cards of the year. Very excited. It's a big opportunity and I'm looking to, uh, to make the most out of it. So when did you actually know that this is a thing? Like how long ago? Uh, last Tuesday. So one week from yesterday and I'm like in the middle of teaching a big kids jujitsu class and uh, in the middle of class, you know, I, my phone's blown up and, and, you know, naturally I'm teaching. I don't, I don't go get on my phone, but, uh, but the, uh, the program director at my gym, our front desk lady had like walked on the mats, which is unorthodox and hands me the gym phone line. And I'm like, all right, what's up? And she's like, Hey, it's your coach in Dallas. And like, anytime coach safe calls me, I like instantly like get in line and I'm like, all right. And I take the phone call and coach is like, Hey, Morano, you know, they offered Anthony Pettis on the 19th. And I was like, coach, can I call you back after class? And he's like, no, and I was like, <laughs> okay, I'll take the fight. And then, you know, so I immediately, you know, like tell my striking coaches at the gym with me, he's teaching you know, kickboxing class. I'm like, Hey, you know, you'll never guess what they just offered. And I'm like, but you know, I don't know if Pettis is going to accept. I don't know if the UFC is like actually going to book it. I just, there's a bunch of unknowns and like, I'm talking less than 20 minutes later before the class is even over. I, uh, my phone just starts blowing up and they, and ESPN, Brett, Brett Okamoto had post the fight was, a, a, was a go. And I was like, how did they find out? I literally just said yes, like minutes ago. So, I mean, it was on, you know, I had, I had less than 20 minutes to kind of like be in that surreal state of mind. And then like, as soon as it was announced, I was like, awesome. I get to do some damage to Pettis. It's time to rock and roll. That's amazing, man. This this whole year has been interesting for you, hasn't it? Like you started off UFC 247 against Chaos Williams, last minute opponent switch. Didn't go your way, but then you bounced back. You had that nice win in November against Reese McKee, and now you're fighting a former world champion to cap things off. If someone told you in or February was when that fight happened, excuse me. If someone told you in February after the Chaos Williams fight that you'd be fighting Anthony Pettis at the end of the year, that would be stricken by a pandemic that you probably didn't even know much about at the time. <laughs> what would you have said to them? You know, my coach said the same thing. He was like, Morano, imagine if I told you to be fighting Pettis, you know, after your loss in February. I was like, there's no way I would never have believed you. And like beyond uh, losing the chaos fight in my hometown in front of everyone, in front of everybody, you know, the lockdown happens. I almost go out of business. Uh, man, I had a, my, my middle brother had passed away. Um, I had a, I was on a hunting trip and a friend got shot. This year was bad. Like this. Uh, and then like I was telling my striking coaches, like, dude, this year can't get any worse. And like the next day as he's leaving the gym, a guy runs a red light and hits him. He was fine. But like we stopped saying things couldn't get worse because things kept getting worse. And then thankfully, you know, business kind of picks back up in October and November. I get the fight. I win the fight, you know, and then uh, and then I get this this fight offer in December. I got a really cool, you know, opportunity for my, my gym and my team coming at the end of the year as well. The year, thankfully, has really turned around. And I am like captain positive energy. Like, you know, I try to be optimistic no matter what happens. And this year was really testing that. But thankfully, it's it's finished pretty strong. Has this been like the most trying year for you? I mean, it has the opportunity to end in a really strong way. But in terms of just trying to balance out the positive and the negatives and, and try to get over that hump and, and stay positive like you normally are. Has this been one of those years where it's been more difficult than any other? I mean, yeah, you know, and, and I've been very grateful and thankful that like my life has had the the route that it's taken. I haven't had many bad years. I mean, I can't really think of anything. And then really from like 2015 on has just been like so many cool, like, you know, like got to the UFC, you know, like full owner of my gym, you know, bought a house, p paid the house off. Like everything has just been kind of, you know, going up and up. And uh, yeah, I guess 2017, I think I was when I fought Nico Price. And then I fought Keita Nakamura, so I had no contest and a, and a loss that year. So that I mean, uh, like competition-wise, that was no fun. But the year itself was a good year, and uh, yeah. So this has certainly b been a uh, a growing year for sure. And not only for myself, like the the entire planet, not even the U.S. But you know, it's been it's been tough for everyone. So any bit of good news or opportunistic moments that I can find this year, I'm really trying to cling on to and make the most out of them. And uh, and, and finishing this year. 
as such is is a really good way to kind of counteract all the negativity. So it's been it's been awesome. Well, I'm happy you've been able to find some silver linings. I'm sorry about all the things that have happened to you this year. Um, I did want to touch on one of the things that you that that did happen this year, the chaos fight, because, you know, as everybody knows or should know, you were supposed to fight Diego Lima. Switch happens on like a week's notice. Didn't go your way. Chaos is, you know, kind of taken off at this point. What did you take away from that from that night in, in Houston, Texas? Yeah, again, going back to like, you know, being optimistic and, uh, you know, anytime I lose a fight, the, the last thing I want is like any sympathy. I don't want few people to feel bad for me. And I always take away lessons. And honestly, that chaos loss is what gives me so much confidence for this Pettis fight because like I studied tape on chaos. I know his skill set. I know how much time he's spent training the odds makers. You know, he was like a plus four fifty dog. There were two takeaways I had from that fight. One, if chaos can beat me, I can beat anybody. Like anyone can beat anyone in MMA. Like I can beat Pettis. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be a, a decent underdog in this fight too. Uh, on the on the on the bookmakers and i actually prefer that you know more to win less to lose and uh, and two i was like why why am i doing this now now granted i really enjoy the training and the hardship and the camaraderie and the fight camps but like you know i would you know for that for that you know chaos fight camp the diego lima fight camp you know i drove to and from dallas every week for eight weeks you know had to stay in hotels and just like stay away from the family and the gym, but there's like a lot of sacrifice that again, I'm happy to do, but it, it starts to get taxing around like week six, week seven, week eight. And I was like, why am I going, why am I like torturing myself? And there was one defining answer. It wasn't for money. It wasn't for notoriety. It was uh, because it's fun. Like it's, it's to experience life in its most extreme state. And like, and what I found is these fights, you know, like if you go get into like a street fight, like an altercation out in a bar and in a parking lot, whatever, it's a, it's more sinister. You know, you have like the, the implication of the law getting arrested. You have like potentially getting, you know, a weapon pulled on you, getting damaged, getting jumped, whatever. It's, it's, it's not a fun feeling. Whereas these, these MMA fights, it's a, it's based around like glory and, 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 and like prize money. So your opponent signed up for the potential risk. You're getting paid handsomely for it. You know, I have the support of all the fans and my teammates and my family. It's it's a much more glorious, positive feel. And then experiencing like the adrenaline rush, the excitement, sometimes the fear. It's just like really raw emotion. And what I what I did my last fight against Reese is I tried not to censor any of that emotion. And I tried to feel everything I could and it gave me more control. Normally I would choose like the most hardcore walkout song I can find, which is usually on Montemarth. But uh, this time I chose something like a little more melodic, a little lighter hearted. And, uh, you know, right before my walkout song came on, I was getting into that like death or victory mentality. And then when the song came on, I like took a breath and I told myself, I was like, I want to put on a master class of technique and, and control this fight and be patient and find my range and be technical. And I feel like I was able to, to turn that flip. Whereas when I fought chaos, you know, I felt the energy of my home crowd and I was like, I was I accepted the brawl and like paid the ultimate price for it. I made the decision to to fight like that and it, it got out of hand quick. And I'm like, I, I can accept that responsibility and learn from my lessons, but I won't make that mistake again. And I just feel like I'm in such a serene state in my career right now in terms of like not only decision making, but like control of the of the mental side of it, which I feel has always been a strong suit of mine. And, uh, and it's just, I feel like everything's like on the up and up right now, which is great. Everything's just getting stronger than it was before. Did not having the crowd at the apex when you fought Reese, did that help in that process? Um, I like the crowd. I like the energy. Um, and I like the, I like hearing when somebody gets dropped, you know, if, it's, if I'm the one getting dropped, usually you don't hear anything because you go on a defense mode, but like when you hit someone or drop someone, it's cool hearing the crowd. Cause it like encourages you to finish. It encourages me to try to finish. Um, I actually, I don't want to say I prefer the apex, but, but I really do enjoy it. I enjoy the, the, the small octagon actually feels normal because people are asking, you know, what do you like better? The big, the big cage or the small cage. And I don't, I don't really know when I'm in the big cage, it feels really big. When I'm in the small cage, it feels normal, like fighting on the local scene again. And it's still a pretty big cage. So I like the close quarters nature of it. And I like, I just, I like the, the martial arts aspect. It's, you know, it, it makes it seem like it's more for 
like martial arts credit than glory because there's not a bunch of fans there. And I just kind of appreciate that. Plus, I always enjoyed the hardship of fights. So like hearing my opponent breathe heavy, hearing him quit, get hurt, whatever, has always been like a fun psychological aspect that I try to delve into every time. And this makes that a little bit easier. So like you talked about earlier, not only are you competing on this card, you're sharing it with some teammates, including Jeff Neal, who is headlining against Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. I mean, both of you guys just have these massive fights against these big names. I mean, this has to be a pretty cool moment, not just for you, but for the entire team, right? Yeah, last night, Coach was, was, was walking us through it. And I'll tell you, I wonder how many rounds I did yesterday with Jeff. We did like an hour of like strategy, movement, fit, and work. And then we did our hard sparring work. I must have done seven or eight rounds with them. And I'll tell you, I'm glad I'm not Wonder Boy. Jeff is sharp right now. Um, and man, that's a, that's a, I was telling Jeff too. I was like, I was like, buddy, I know I'm biased. I was like, but of all the welterweights in the UFC, you're the last person I'd ever want to fight. And granted, I do a lot of rounds with them. So I know how bad things can go. And man, he, that, that guy's a, he's something special, man. I can't wait to see him become champion. You know, it's awesome. He's headlining the card. I'm, I'm honored to be on the main card. My first time being on a main card, fighting Pettis of all people. So, you know, training with Jeff yesterday, I had to be Wonder Boy. He was, he was being Pettis. And uh, it was just a really fun kind of like last, I guess not our last hard day, but like one of our last hard sessions for this fight camp. And I, I got on the, I got on the lucky and I only had two weeks of hard work. I know he's been grinding it out for, you know, close to two months now. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's really cool. You know, we kind of like feed off of each other's energy. And, uh, and I'm really excited to, to have, you know, friends to hang out with while we're at, you know, COVID in, in Vegas for the week and all that fun stuff. So I'm looking forward to fight week on Tuesday. I mean, I know you haven't had a lot of time since Penn went to paper, but have you talked to Diego Fajeda at all? Because I know he fought Anthony earlier. He's a Fortis guy as well. Came the first man to submit him back in January on that Connor Cowboy card. That has to build like a little more confidence knowing that there is sort of a blueprint that your team has put together in, in order to beat him. But have you talked to Diego at all about this fight? Uh, yeah, yeah, we've spoken a bit. Uh, I, Coach has more so been like the bridge between our experiences. And, you know, Carlos Diego Fiera, he and I have different styles. So, you know, Coach Safe has done a good job kind of implementing what we're good at to win this fight. And uh, and CDF is the man. I remember watching that fight with my friends at home. If I'm not mistaken, that was in January of this year. Yeah. And, uh, and man, I was hyping him up. And, uh, you know, I teach quite a bit of jujitsu and, uh, Carlos Diego Fiera used a high crotch entry to a body lock, to a back take, which in my opinion is one of the best wrestling entries with a single leg or a high crotch into like a jujitsu finish with the body lock drag down back takes. And I'm just a big fan of that style. And I always use that fight in particular as a reference to my students when teaching. So I'm very familiar with like the routes in that fight. And, uh, and man, we kind of dodged each other because CDF is fighting uh, Burrell Dariush yeah. pretty soon. So I know he'll be starting camp soon. So I was at Fortis, you know, while he was doing his thing it, uh, on the border. And I know he'll be going up to Fortis here soon for, you know, his eight weeks. And we're actually going to have crossed paths, which is sad. But when he did fight Pettis, I was actually showing up just to be a good teammate and help the guys out. So I actually had to emulate Pettis for him a couple of times. So yeah, I was very much so involved in that camp and it's just, it's just good to have some comfortability, you know, with the style of the guy I'm fighting and knowing that a teammate beat him is, is helpful. A lot of people feel like Anthony is, I don't know, sort of at the end of the line, like they'll look at a topology page more than his fights himself and be like, oh, he's lost four out of seven. But like, if you, if you take a deeper look at who he's lost to, it's Diego, uh, who was just a monster. I think he could be a bre like a complete breakout guy at 55 this, and, in 2021. Lost to Nate, lost to Ferguson in a fight that I don't think gets enough credit as, as far as entertaining fights. And then Dustin and Max and so forth and so on. I mean, he's losing to the best of the best. And last year, he Superman punched KO'd Wonderboy Thompson into the shadow realm. <laughs> well, well, maybe his like his best days are behind him. Like maybe he's not going to be fighting for a belt anytime soon. Still a very dangerous guy with a big name, right? I mean, this is certainly a guy you can't sleep on. And I'm sure that you're keeping that in mind, right? Hell no. Dude, even Reese McKee, I was thinking was the most dangerous man on the planet when I fight him. I, I am, I, I try to be as self-aware as possible. And, and one thing that certain coaches that I've had in the past would do is they would like, like hype me up and kind of like downplay my opponents and coming up in the ranks. I never did that. I would always envision my opponents to be these big monsters. Cause I fought some big ass welterweights in my day. 
And when I would see him at weigh-ins, I'm like, I'm like, Matt, my strike coach, I'm like, dude, this dude's small. And he looks at me, he's like, dude, he's not that small. And I'm like, yeah, but he's smaller than I envisioned him to be. So I always like, I would always make my opponents actually bigger and better than they really were. So when I actually got to fight him, it wasn't as hard as I imagined, opposed to being like, oh, you know, this dude's coming off a loss. He's old. He sucks. And if you expect him to be bad and in the fight, they're better than you expect, then you're like, oh, I misprepared. So I've always tried to do the opposite. So I know I'm fighting the best Anthony Pettis that there's ever been. And I keep glancing over and I got my, my computer right next to me and I have the typology page. And just, just I'm going to I'm gonna read off, you know, he got a loss to Barboza. Barboza's the man. He's got a win over Charles Oliveira, who is, you know, a contender. He's got a loss to Holloway, who's the, the best. He's got a win over Jim Miller, a loss to Poye, who's the best. A win over Chiesa, who is a good grappler. A loss to Tifer. No one wants to fight the boogeyman. A <laughs> knockout over Thompson. And then a, a loss to Diaz, a loss to CDF, and a win over Cerrone. And then my name is at the top. Just like being on this list of these like legendary fighters, it brings me such pride. And uh, and again, it makes me want to like jump at this opportunity, you know, like head first with both hands up, man. I I, I can't wait. And uh, and again, I'm not. I mean, if there's a, if there's any opponent I've ever had to not overlook, it's Pettis, and I'm certainly not doing that. You mentioned self awareness. You're a very self aware guy. If you go out there and you beat a guy like Anthony Pettis next Saturday and you do so impressively, do you allow yourself to think about where a win over Anthony can take you? Like, do you allow, allow yourself to get to that place or are you just solely focused on Pettis December 19th and nothing more? I mean, yeah, there, you know, it opens the floodgates every night since I've taken this fight as I lay in bed before I go to sleep. I just imagine what if it opens up like an endless possibility of fights. And, uh, and again, naturally. So like one thing my coach was saying and, I, and he, he put into words exactly what I was thinking, like celebrating, getting the fight is not the goal. Celebrating the victory is, is, is what I need to focus most on. And that is the hardest task at hand. But, uh, there's just no telling. Like I've already looked through the UFC's top 15 welterweights and I'm like, man, this would be a cool fight. That'd be a cool fight. And, uh, and again, just like winning this fight is what is going to get me to the next level in my career. And I, and I just, and the fact that, you know, they even asked me my name, like the matchmakers to fight Pettis already puts me there, which is great, but like to, more to prove to myself than anything else, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to win this fight. Like I'm going to, I'm going to take it to him and take it from him and win this fight. Like I will, I am willing to give my life to take his on the 19th. And, and I know Pettis is a gamer. But if he's not like ready to, to fight to the death, then it's going to be a rough fight. How do you how, how do you see this thing going down? Like I'm, I know you you feel like you're walking out with your hand raised, but is there like a certain vision you have before your your eyes shut tight when you go to sleep? Because I'm sure you've seen this fight end in a million different ways and go go down in a million different ways since you you signed the contract. How do you kind of what, what's sort of the consistent vision in your mind? I mean, I always just envision knockouts ever since I started training, you know, in every interview, I've told myself this just one to not give anything away, but two to hopefully strike some fear into the hearts of my opponents. But I'm always gunning for a knockout. Best case scenario, I score a knockout. But in this fight, I I'm like planning on like a three round war decision victory with my primary goal to do as much damage within 15 minutes as possible. And with that goal, I'm hoping the finish will present itself. But at this high level, my I'm going to try to make zero mistakes and just and 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 find my times to be offensive and and just really again just try to put on a master class of, of mixed martial arts is, is my goal. So I mean, I'm looking for like a third round finish. If anything, just to make sure if the first round goes and the second round goes, I'm not like you know, dang, I didn't I didn't do what I was hoping to do. So I was playing for a third round a third round grind. Have you visualized like the walkouts and stuff? Because I know like there there are fighters who like will visualize every second of it, even the walkout. Because I'm sure you're probably gonna walk out first and he'll walk out second, so you're gonna watch him walk to the cage, and it becomes just like this real thing, right? Yeah, you know what? I got two two hours of octagon time. I've made the walk eleven times. I I do envision that a lot. I'm still on the fence of my walkout song. <laughs> But which is not, you know, I, I couldn't really care, but it's just right. it's a kind of a fun aspect. Plus, I've actually gotten to know some of these bands because they're like a little less mainstream than like most. But uh, but yeah, I, I've envisioned that a million times and uh, I really can't wait to be in Vegas, you know, going to the UFC PI to train a bit. You know, they have the octagon there. It's just it's just cool to be in that environment. 
it's just cool to be in the UFC, man. It's and I plan on being there for at least another five years, you know, and, and then I'll I'll rearrange my goals accordingly. But it's a been it's been a blast, man. And like it's funny, like the longer I've been with the company, it seems like the more opportunities I'm getting, and I'm starting to like see the same employees and have more conversations with Sean and Dana and Mick. It's just nice. It's nice being kind of a mainstay. That's great, especially the, the the way this year began for you. To see you have this opportunity is is really cool to see. You you have the chance to become a guy that people are going to paying a lot more attention to after December nineteenth. You know, we've seen guys like Shemaev and guys like Kevin Holland and and others break out, and you know you could come in there and just end the year in a big way and have all that momentum. So as you take on Anthony Pettis to wrap up the festivities of of twenty twenty. But listen, I know you got other interviews to do, so I'll let you go. But thank you for the time, my man. All the best to you in the fight, and, and well deserved, man. I appreciate the time.